So the aim of the research is to understand what an ordinary person would do if they were faced with a fire. And now, unsurprisingly, it's probably not going to be close all the doors, immediately walk out and call 999. So that's what we're going to try and figure out. What do they do instead? Uh, so a little bit of context. Currently, uh, West Midlands Fire Service, and I think it's fairly consistent across all the services, have a five-minute uh, time to attend uh, from the first appliance to incidents where life and property are at risk. That's a fairly short amount of time, considering the timescales we talked about earlier. So we've got to consider, are people doing things in a way that could slow down our response, so get us there too late to do anything about it? And so that's where we're going, that's the angle we're taking. Also, we've got to acknowledge that there are fairly uh, considerable political as well as other constraints upon us. And if we look at in terms of reductions of funding, 10% reduction forecast for 2015-16, further cut of 14% over 2016 to 2018. And that really presents a challenge in terms of our resources. And thus, can we actually respond in the appropriate times? Again, we know that two minutes can be, mean the difference between life and death. Can we respond in the appropriate time if we don't understand what people actually do when they see a fire? So the national average is 7.4 minutes to respond to a fire. I think we're slightly above that at the moment in terms of West Med Fire Service. Uh, and there's been a yearly increase in time to respond to fires uh, as per the Department uh, of Communities and Local Government. At least they've suggested. But response time is a key issue for the Fire Brigade Union. Uh, and they've suggested uh, that the increased uh, response time would have impacts at 13 additional fatalities in dwellings and other fire buildings each year, 65 additional deaths in road traffic collisions, and 85 million pound increases in other buildings' fire damage. So a fairly costly consideration. Which is why, then, our response times are so important, which is why it's important to understand what people do. So as we can see here, uh, fatality rates by your response time, we can see that there is a considerable increase up to about 20 minutes. It's fairly safe. We, can, we have a good rate. Uh, but after 20 minutes, it becomes problematic. But if you think about it, you can not know what to do with a fire for more than 20 minutes. Uh, so this is obviously really important in terms of how we do something about making sure we're, we're within these constraints. Uh, a little bit more sciencey for you. Uh, so if we have a look, the general rule is an increase in response times is an increase in fatalities. I think we can't deny that as a general rule. And we can see it's not particularly problematic early on, but the later and later we get, uh, the more likely there are to be fatalities. So that's the premise we're accepting. And again, just for a bit of context, here's some different, uh, different levels in terms of different types of dwelling. We can see that some are particularly problematic already, so some like caravans, uh, and some do have a fairly dangerous trajectory. Uh, so, copy some of the slides from earlier. Happy days. And what we can see here is there's a really sensitive time. So actually, we see in terms of occupant recognition, it takes 40 seconds somebody to even recognize there's a fire to go on. And then there's another 30 seconds of dialing. There's basically processes where we can make a difference. Okay, so we can't do anything about, for example, uh, appliance travel time. Unless we find some way to time travel, we can't do much about that. And, but what we can do is work on the human behaviors. We can look at what do humans do in those sorts of situations and try and come up with some sort of intervention. So we're looking at the sensitive periods in which we think we can make changes uh, and obviously then reduce this total time taken, which hopefully then should decrease the amount of fatalities. Uh, so the victim's response to fire is important. And if you look at any typical handbook or manual, it's assumed that upon being aware of the fire, people would immediately remove themselves from danger, run out the building and call 999 immediately. Uh, we can be honest, that's not what most people do. Uh, and this is a research that's going to explore that. Um, can we really think that that's going to happen? 
For example, how many people would go back in to get their laptop, their computer, their whatever? Okay. We, have had, we know there's lots of incidents, I'm sure you've been to them, where people have come outside, called the 999, and gone back into the building. Okay. So we know people don't just go out and stay out and shut all the doors behind them. And there has been a little bit of past literature exploring what are, what are the psychological factors going on in terms of these human behaviours to fires. So we know from a report from Salford Uni in Greater Manchester um, that people feel embarrassed when it happens to them. Sometimes they feel guilty. Um, some people believe that fires just happen. And again, it goes back to this guilt, this embarrassment. And indeed, older age, as one of you noted earlier, does increase the risk. Uh, indeed, people like to investigate the fire. They like to know what was the cause, can they do anything about it, to go back in and find out more. Uh, and obviously that is problematic too. So, minutes remaining in the property increase the risk to life. And so if we better understand people's actions, we can better inform public policy, public information, and deal with those with concerns. So, the current study is what I'm going to talk about. So we're going to explore the ways in which individuals respond to fire. And what we're going to do is use interviews with people who have been a victim of fire, who previously had fire. Um, and we're going to interview them and see what they did, what they felt, what the psychological process is going on. And again, as Gail said, we're using uh, thematic analysis. That's when we transcribe all their interviews and have a look at are there themes, are there patterns of discourse, are there patterns of talking, and if so, are they telling us something interesting? So we've got various participants. Um, here's a little bit of introduction so you have a bit of context. Uh, first one was male, age 50, not working, lives in a low-rise block of flats. Uh, second, male, we don't know his age, uh, employed, lives in a three-bed, uh, semi-detached house. Um, I'll pause for a second so you can read if you wish. What we've got is a range of individuals from a range of different experiences see whether there were any common themes of discourse. So we have another male aged 75, detached four bedroom house, female aged 50, uh, she was a carer to her children, and lived in a terrace house. Female aged 94, she was retired, she was a lovely lady, lives in a three bedroom Victorian semi-detached house. A female aged 81, employed, lives in a three bedroom terrace house. Uh, last one, I'm sure you'd be glad to know, Female aged 30, full-time mum, uh, and a female aged 69 who wasn't working. So we've got a, a fair range of individuals across the spectrum. And we asked them, what alerted you to the fire? Okay. Most people would instantly think, well, it's a fire alarm going off, isn't it? Um, two respondents said it was smoke. So they opened the door and they found some sort of dense, thick, noxious, stinking smoke. Uh, Two reported hearing the alarm. But there was also that some that smelt the burning. Uh, one respondent said it wasn't an explosion. That's a fairly significant indicator of a fire. I think you'll agree. Uh, and one responded that the power switching off in the house. Okay, so when we think about just in terms of what alerts people to fires, it is not just the alarm. It's other things too. We have to consider that. What was your initial response? What did you do immediately? Four respondents telephoned the fire brigade prior to leaving the house. They didn't even do anything, they just picked up the phone immediately. Uh, so four of the eight, that's not bad. Um, two respondents attempted to extinguish the fire, basically went to get some water to dry underneath. One attempted to remove the appliance from the house, so there was a white good that was causing problems. Uh, so they tried to drag it halfway through their house to get it outside. Uh, what goes on in their head when they do that, I'm not sure. Uh, and one that responded uh, telephoned the fire brigade and stayed in the property uh, to put stuff around the door, from the door to stop any getting any smoke coming through the gas. Uh, I remained in my flat. So we also have a variety of different responses to fire um, that maybe wouldn't be predictable. Uh, and because of uh, as being psychologists, I'm afraid we had to ask, and how did that make you feel? Classic question. Uh, and the obvious answer is anxious or shaky. Uh, and I think that's fair enough. When I realised what was happening, I was a nervous wreck. I got the shakes and just panicked. Now, 
that doesn't sound like somebody who's got a clear head and is going to immediately run out the property and call 999. <coughs> uh, other people reported a surreal feeling. It's like somebody else ran thinking back about it. Uh, one felt in control. They remembered they had a uh, fire extinguisher. They tried to sort the problem. And another reported feeling helpless. When I checked, I, when I checked it, I was upset there was a fire. Well, what can I do? Nothing. I think, again, that's quite problematic. Because if you feel helpless, you don't take any action. If you don't take any action, we can't get to the problem. And finally, a question you guys probably be fairly interested in. Do you trust the fire brigade? Uh, and the good news, seven of the eight individuals said that they completely did and that you all did a good job, happy days. So, uh, gold star for you all. Uh, one respondent did uh, suggest some sort of negative comment, uh, but that was mainly due to um, damage to their property that obviously they felt you could have done something about. Uh, whether or not that's true, uh, I'm not going to weigh in on that debate. Um, but we can see that actually you, they do trust you. They do, uh, they do feel comfortable with you being involved. And so these are the themes um, to recap what was going on. So it wasn't just the fire alarm that alerted them to fire. It was so many other things. Equally, their response was certainly not unanimous, and it certainly wasn't predictable. Okay? We have to consider that humans are a little bit crazy. We do things that we cannot predict. And we have to take that into consideration because we have to use realistic rules. We can't just make the assumption that everybody does the same thing and that thing can be written down in the textbook easily. That's not true. Uh, and similarly, there are a lot of emotions and it is an emotional situation to have a fire in your home when maybe your family, maybe your property is at risk. Uh, and again, that too can impact the way we make decisions. So we know now that the rules that we take um, for granted are wrong. So what do we do next? That's a problem. We've got a problem, how do we fix it? Well, the first thing is, people don't know how to respond to incidents. Uh, most people panic, I'm sure I would, uh, stay in the property to make a call rather than to extinguish it or remove themselves from the situation. So we need to give them a clearer education of what to do in this sort of situation. For example, from the previous slide, we need to get them to close the doors. Simple message, really simple message that we can communicate easily. Everybody on here is fairly active in Twitter. How's that for a tweet? Very simple message, can, predict, can save somebody's life. Simple. And that sort of education that we make is key because we're acknowledging that people are humans, they do do silly things, but we can give them easy messages that they can digest and we can do something about it. Equally, some other things that we can do. What we're hoping to do, uh, again, pictures nicked from the last slide, you'll see that we can map human responses onto the chemical responses in a fire. Again, if we do that, we can find out what are the sensitive time periods in which we need to take action, and where is the sensitive period at which we definitely have to be there to save their life. And I think if we map the human side, the human behaviors, in addition to the chemicals and the fire side, we can actually get a proper timeline of events, and in that way we can better predict the times of arrivals and what the important times to be there are. Uh, we're also going to partner with uh, LifeVid, uh, who I'm sure you will be talking to later, uh, in terms of getting a much larger, larger selection uh, of comments of individuals, to get a survey out there for everybody who experiences a fire, and to see, well, what are the patterns going on there? Are they the same? Um, so we might get a more representative view of how individuals do respond to fire uh, and what we can 